please stand and remain standing. When I call your name, stand and remain standing. Matt, Katri, Maddy, and Gabby Borman, please stand and remain standing. Shanti Supio, Shanti Supio, Sister Joseph Richards from Mount Raleigh Church, Clovis from Marigat, and Pink from St. Martin. Amen. We are happy that you decided to come and fellowship with us this morning. I hope that after you leave this service, you will say, I met my friend Jesus and I want to spend eternity with him. Every Phillipsburg member to the back, front, or side of them, give them for me a special Phillipsburg welcome. To our regular members, we say, welcome, welcome, welcome. As we fellowship together, may the Spirit of the Lord infuse us with joy, happiness, and love. On behalf of the pastor, the elders, the officers, and the members of the church, again I say, welcome to the Phillipsburg Seminary Adventist Church. And as you fellowship with us, may you indeed be truly blessed. Welcome. We now continue our service with the use of hymn number 119, 119, angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight over all the earth, 119.
going to turn to the back of our hymnals. Hymn number 712 should be on the screen. I'll read the first line, and the congregation will read the second line. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to the Lord, for, for his mercies endure it forever. I'll do the first, you do the second. Give thanks to the God of gods. Alone he works great marvels. In wisdom he made the heavens. He laid the earth upon the waters. He made the great light. The sun to rule by day. The moon and the star to rule by night. He remember us when we are down. And rest from our enemies. He give us food. He gives food to all his creatures. Together give thanks to the God of heaven. It is the sweetest name we know. Two, five, three.
sweet name, their name. There is no other name like Jesus. This morning we want to ask God for one pure and holy passion. One magnificent obsession to seek after him with all our hearts, with all our minds. That is what God wants from us, to seek after him and to serve him in spirit and in truth. This morning we come in his courts to pray. And as he said, his house shall be a house of prayer. And we want to talk to our father this morning. If the Holy Spirit moves you to be here to meet him at the altar, you are welcome. As we will all talk to our God, giving him thanks, bringing complaints to him, bringing our cares, our worries, our perplexities, everything. He said, cast all your cares upon me, for he cared for you. This morning we will talk to our Father, and he's waiting to hear from us as we speak to him this morning. Days have filled with sorrows and cares, hearts are lonely and dread, but burdens are lifted and Calvary, Jesus is very much as possible as we talk to our Father. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the one who sits higher and looks low. Heaven is your throne. Hurt is your footstool. And we, your children, bow before your presence this morning, giving thee thanks and praise for your goodness, for your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God, you have been good to us. You have been merciful. You have been kind. You have been loving. And Lord, we want to say how thankful we are that today we are in the land of living. We are in your course of praise to lift up, to magnify, to glorify your high and holy name. You are worthy of our praises, oh dear Father. You are worthy of our thanksgiving. Not because of our goodness, oh dear God, but because of your love, and your mercy and your care. You are so awesome. You are so loving. Our minds cannot fathom, oh dear Father, the love that you have for us. As your word said, therefore in love and kindness have you drawn us unto yourselves. Heavenly Father, we look back and we evaluate our life, oh dear Father. And we see, dear God, where we have fallen short of your glory. Where we have sinned, where we have put you to shame, oh dear Father. And Lord, we ask, oh Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Wash us from our sins. Clem us, O oh dear Father, from all unrighteousness. And purge us, O oh dear Father, that we shall be whiter than snow. Gracious Father, we come before you pour, pouring out our complaints. We come against all addiction. Whether it is sexual addiction, O oh dear Father. Whether it's um, drugs, whether it's marijuana, whether it's alcohol. Whatever the addiction is, O oh dear Father, we put it forth into thy hands. And we commit to dear Father. So Lord, remove it from us in the name of Jesus. Oh, gracious Father, we know that our power belongs to you. We know that, dear Lord, at the name, at the mention of the name of Jesus, there is power. Power to cleanse, power to refresh, power to renew, power to fix that which was broken and make it anew in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, even now as we come before your presence, oh, dear Father, send your Holy Spirit to intertwine with us. Send your Holy Spirit to condescend upon us, oh, dear Father, and break us and mold us, oh, dear Father, set us free. From the band of the evil one, O oh dear Father, we pray. Lord, we give you thanks, O oh dear Lord, that he, he had not snatched us away. But because of your mercy and your grace, we are here this morning to lift up and to praise your holy name. O oh, gracious Father, we give you thanks for our brothers and sisters. We give you thanks, O oh dear Father, that those who are here today and for those who are not. Those who are going through rough times. Those who are going through struggles. Those who are perplexed. 
those who are feeling discouraged oh dear father in the name of jesus reach out your merciful hands oh dear lord and touch where it hurts touch where the problem is oh dear father bring healing bring restoration oh dear father we pray which only you can do gracious god we call out to you this morning hear us and so our prayer we ask oh dear lord have mercy upon us, O oh dear Lord, because we cannot help ourselves. Only you can help us. Lord, we pray for those who are shut in. Those who are in a bed of affliction, O oh dear Lord. Have mercy upon them, O oh dear Lord, and be with them. And comfort and uplift them. We put before you, dear Lord, the man servant. The one you have anointed to speak the word of life this morning. We ask, O oh Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Use him in a mark and powerful way. Speak to him. Direct him, O oh dear Father. Use him. May the word coming from his mouth find lodging in our hearts. May your heart lift, be lifted high. And may your soul cry out to thee, dear Father, we pray. We pray for every visitors. Lord, speak to them. Touch their life today, dear Father. And may today experience will never be the same. Lord, we pray for our children that have come back home from studies, O oh dear Father. We pray for those who have gotten the victory and the success in their studies. We ask that you will continue to bless their endeavors and open ways, open doors for them, O oh Heavenly Father, we pray. Lord, what we fail of asking you, because of our limited knowledge, O oh dear Lord, grant unto us, your children. Hear us, O oh dear Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. In keeping with the words of the master teacher, our little ones will now be blessed with the children's story told by Sister Christine Cummins. Children, please walk quietly to the front and occupy the first two benches in the middle aisle. The first two benches on both sides of the middle aisle, children, please come forward for your story, quietly. The first two benches, yes, in the front. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, boys and girls. Okay. Complete this sentence for me. We are in the month of 
complete the sentence. We are in the month of. That's right. And June, we are dealing with a special word. We talked about it before. The word. Oh, this. <laughs> the word begins with P. Prudence. Oh, not prudence. Prudence is at our school, but at church, we are dealing with another P word. Who think they know what that word is? No. I can use this word to describe teacher Crone. I can use this word to describe teacher Illich. I can use this word to describe sister Richardson and a lot of others that I can't call the names right now. Peaceful. That's a nice word, but that's not a word. Parents? No. Pretty. It has to do with time. It has to do with time. Patience. She said patience. That's not the word. Come on. What is the word? I'm going to spell a part of the word for you. It begins like this. P-U-N. Think again. P U N C. Punctuation? <laughs> no. You have a part of the word. Who wants to say the word? Punctual. Punctual is the word. How many of you are punctual? How many of you are always punctual? You know what punctual means? On time. Sometimes? All the time. You are always on time. Now, when we can be punctual, it means we are showing respect. You know? It is a means of showing respect for persons and the times. See the word up there? What does that word say? Punctuality. And that is our word for June. Now, I'm going to challenge you at the end of this story, okay? Now, when you go to school in the morning, who do you see at school who's the first person you see at school Mike my friends your friends who is the first person you see at school your teacher when you step in the seven Adventist school who do you see at that gate teacher Illich teacher Illich now when you see teacher Illich what question goes on in your mind this is for some of the children who attend our school I'm coming to the rest of you what goes on in your mind do you ask yourself she's on time always she's on time but what do you ask yourself if I'm on time yes even me I like looking at the time am I on time <laughs> yes because once you see her standing there you know you have to be careful with the time now when you are late how does it make you feel how does it make you feel if you are going to school and you show up late and you didn't only show up late one time, two time, three time. It makes me feel like I'm not a part of the school no more. It makes you feel like you're not a part of the school. What other words you can use to describe how it makes you feel when you're late? Sad. It makes you feel sad. How else do you feel? As an adult, I sometimes feel really, really... Bad. Feel bad. I feel embarrassed sometimes. When I'm late, I feel embarrassed. And that is how it makes you feel. And sometimes when you're trying to be early, there is something that happens to you. You feel this way. You're not on time. You're trying hard and you're still not making it. And it makes you feel... Bad, sad. It puts a lot of stress on you. Isn't that so? Yes, it puts a lot of stress on you when you're late. It puts a lot of stress. It's like, oh gosh, I am late. I have to hear that... Um, go to the office, get a late pass, or try and make it early for school. Now, boys and girls, there are, in, there are lots of areas in which we can be punctual, not only in showing up on time for school, but there is a scripture in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes. We are going to read that scripture together, and then I'm going to share a little story with you. It, it has to do with time, but not showing up on time per se. We're going to read Ecclesiastes. Let's read what it says. Everyone, read. A right time for everything. Everything on earth has its special season. 
Now we are going to deal with that last part that says everything on earth has its special season. Now, I'm from Guyana. And we do planting. We plant all sorts of crops. And one of the major crops that we plant is rice. Do you know that rice is grown? Some people don't know that rice is grown, you know. But rice is actually grown. Now listen carefully to this story. Now rice has its season. Yes, it has its season. You see there? That is how the rice field actually looks. If you look at it on, from on top, if you're flying a plane and you look down, the second picture is what you will see. Now my father-in-law, he plants rice. Yes. He has a plot of land. The plot of land is actually bigger than this area where this church is. Yes, he planted his rice. But guess what? You have to plant the rice when there's a lot of water. Okay? Now, you see a lot of water there, right? Because it needs a lot of water so that the rice can grow. Now, he did all of that. But guess what? He didn't do it at the right time. He didn't start it at the right time. So we are thinking that, okay, it will grow and then, you know, you'll still be able to yield that crop. So when the time came, the rice grew and it was ripe and ready to pick. But other persons, they are picking their rice as well and they started and finished. Now he is waiting for a special machine so that he can cut the rice because he doesn't have his own. So he has to wait on everyone. Now, you're going to look there and you're going to see when the rice is fully ripe that is how it looks and that is the machine that cuts the rice it what we have is not the what you eat yet we have the what we call the paddy then before you can shell it and get the rice so what you see in there is the, actually the paddy that that machine has to cut now that didn't happen for him on time and guess what happened the rain came the rain came again because it takes like a good period of time so you start in the wet season you have to end in the dry season so when it was time for him to cut the rains came and sometimes when rain starts to fall in my country it falls like really heavy and floods the land so when it came guess what happened you see how those are standing see how the rice is standing up there guess what happened when it gets wet the rain makes it fall down because it gets heavy and so that machine would not be able to cut it. And you know what happened? Because he didn't do it on time, he lost the entire crop. And that is really hard because when you, when you plant, you have to pay people to, um, to plant the rice. You have to pay people to do a lot of things. And then guess what? You have to have money to do another crop again. So he lost that entire crop all because of what? What, what is that one word? time so you see how important time is it is important boys and girls and when when we are doing things we start on time so that we can end on time and end on time successfully because it is not always um, about showing up to a place but it has to do with your homework too how many of you get your homework done on time how many of you when you have an assignment to do you start it you don't get homework but do you get assignments how many of you, when you get an assignment, you start it on time so that you don't put yourself under stress and then you get that assignment done so that you can feel good when you, should, when you turn, it, turn it in on time? Do you know that if you turn the assignment late, you can lose points? Yes, you lose points. So boys and girls today, I want to encourage each one of you to, when you have the time, you do the things that you are set out to do, especially when it comes to your schoolwork. Going to school early is a part of it too. As well as, boys and girls, do you know that in heaven, God has his time? You don't know that? Yes, God has his time and God does everything exactly the time when he has it plans out to do. He doesn't, always, he doesn't put it off. If this is supposed to happen at this time, it is going to happen at that time. So what is important is that our time, if we don't want to miss out on being late in heaven, we have to be early on earth. Okay? We have to be on time on earth if we are planning to go to heaven so that we can always be on time. So it is important that we match our timing with the time that God has for us. Okay? We don't, one thing we don't know though 
is a time when Jesus is going to come. But if we are always preparing ourselves, do you think we will be ready? Yes, we will be ready and on time for when he comes. So let us keep that in our minds. At this time, we are going to listen to a song. And if you know the song, you can sing along. Okay? And I want to encourage you to remember to be punctual. Girls, we're going to sing this song, In His Time. Do you know the song, In His Time? In His Time. In His Time. He makes all things beautiful. In His Time. Lord, please. That you do just what you say in your time. One more time. In his time. In his time. pray boys and girls almighty God and our heavenly father we want to thank you today that we could have learned about being punctual we want to thank you Lord that we know that there's a time for everything even the seasons I ask oh dear God that you will be with the boys and girls in a special way help that they will do their best to be punctual in every area of their lives whether it be going, coming to church going to school getting their assignments done and Lord, I pray that as adults, we will be the example for the boys and girls because they learn from us. We want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for all the blessings that you have in store for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, one thing I forget to tell you is your challenge. You're going to remain seated and the boys and girls here will give you your bulletin. Your challenge is your assignments, you're going to turn them in very early. You're going to have to give a, give a report you're making sure that you get to school on time, okay? Sometimes your parents might be the one to not be ready because your parents are the ones taking you to school. You don't just come out and go. But what you can do is get yourself ready on time, okay? Don't wait for them. Get yourself ready on time. Make sure that you, when you have your assignment, you don't submit any late assignment nor late homework, all right? And then you'll come back and you're going to report what it is that you did. And as well, when you're coming to church, you are going to make sure that you come to church on time. All right? Make sure you be here on time. Yes. And again, it's your parents that have to get you out. So you're going to teach them punctuality and let them bring you out. Yes, 9 o'clock. That's correct. So you're going to get your bulletins and you can return to your seat.
It is now time to go into the Word of God. Our scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Please stand when it is found. I will read in your hearing from the King James Version. Verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. It is good to know that God hears and I've heard today, like always, the slightest murmuring and yearning of our inner beings. So today I want you to know that God has heard your murmuring and your yearning, but it's time now for you to hear from God once more. God has sent us a special messenger for his message, his message for today. It is Elder Celestine. And the Valentine Celestine will bring us the word of the Lord today. If we give our undivided attention and patient listening to the Spirit of God, we would hear what God has to say to each one of us. He is originally from St. Martin. He has been born in Dominica. But he's from St. Martin. He's a fisherman. He has developed that type of patience and he believes in practical Christianity. He's someone who, even though he works in, in mechanics, he constantly sees and testifies how God leads him in the midst of his professional achievements. So he trusts his God. And I want you to know that he would bring us today a message entitled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. So let's hear him as he speaks to us. But before Elder Celestine comes forth and brings us that message that will suit our heart and bring happiness and push all the worries on the back burner, I invite us to listen as Brother Connett would come to us and bring us a special music, a special song entitled, The Bells Are Ringing, He Is Alive. Brother Clarence Connett would bless our hearts at this time. Hear him as he sings the word of the Lord. Morning, church.
high priest would move to the temple with bells around the borders of his skirts and as he prepares offerings there the sound of the bells could be heard for there in the holy of holy the sinful priest surely would die the sound of the bells sent a message to all those who waited outside the bells are ringing he's alive oh yes the sacrifice is Wordy, a sound that cannot be denied. The price has been paid, and as our hands are being raised, let His holy name be praised. Tell every nation, every tribe. Where they laid him, and there only silence was found. But on the third day, the stone rolled away, and the whole world woke up to the sound. The bells are ringing, he's alive. Oh, yes, the sacrifice is a sound that cannot be denied Oh, the price has been paid And as the hands are being raised Let His holy name be praised Tell every nation, every tribe Open up your heart and listen Tell me what do you hear It's a sound of salvation Ringing his alive And there's no need to fear The bells are ringing his alive Oh yes Sacrifices worthy, a sound that cannot be denied. Oh, the price has been paid, and as the hands are being raised, let His holy name be praised. Tell every nation, every Bells are ringing, he's alive. 
I could have reached that note about 25 years ago. But now it's impossible. I won't even try it. It's still morning. And permit me about 30 minutes of your time. And just for adventure, things were good. I'll let you out of here in 20 minutes. Good morning again. Ella Gomes, thanks a lot for your introduction. I really thought for a while you were going to say that my kilo of fish weighs more than one kilo. Uh, I am not here to preach Adventist doctrine. Not today. For I have seen people debate and argue after such was done. But I'm going to preach facts and realities that we face with on a daily basis, which is whether we are happy or not. You might not find anything to argue about or debate when I'm through, but instead you might just, it might just cause you to be happy, at least for today. At least for today. Pray with me, loving God and eternal Father. I know I'm undone, but you're using me this morning. So help me, I pray in Jesus' name. In the 80s, a gentleman by the name of Bobby McFerrin wrote a song entitled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. I know quite a lot of us over here have sung that song, even not all the lyrics, but the tune. But I gave it a twist this morning, and I penned a few of the verses. I use my own words, so bear with me. But first, I would like us as God's children to think seriously today whether or not based on the outlook of how things are in this world today, whether in our country, our island, how it is in our community, in the street that we live, at the schools that are close to us in our community, based on these things. The phrase, don't worry, be happy, is it relevant or not? In this life, we have some trouble. I'm just quoting what Farron wrote. I give it a twist somehow. When you worry, you make it double. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Irma passed and took your roof away and wet your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord said your rent is late. He may have to leave the gate. Don't worry, be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. You know, when you have money, you have style. You lost your job, and it's not your fault. It's the looter's fault. Right now, it's more frowns than smiles. So, don't worry. Be happy. When you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. So, don't worry. Be happy. We worry about so many things. Endless things. We worry about debts. We worry about safety. We worry about time. We worry about money, our children, our health. Sometimes, you know what? We even worry about how much we worry. We worry so much that we can't even sleep sometimes at night. I mean, you know what I'm speaking about. In Luke 10, Jesus visits a home. The home of Martha and Mary. And while Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him talk, Martha was in the kitchen doing all the preparation. And Martha began to worry because she was stuck with doing all, everything herself. She was making the salad, she was peeling the potatoes, she was stewing whatever had to be stewed. She was worried. And so she came to Jesus and complained. In verse 40, she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care 
that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her. Now listen what she's telling Jesus. Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, Jesus tells Martha, only one thing is necessary. When we are overcome with worry, we have done what Martha did. We have forgotten the one thing sitting at the feet of Jesus. But we so often put our trust in other things that when they don't work out the way we want them to, we start to worry. And we become afraid because we're so focused on our own agenda and when things get off track, we can't handle it because we've lost control. But let me tell you, the real problem is not that We've lost control, you know. The real problem is that we have forgotten that we, ne we had, have never meant to be in control. We were never to be in control. In, in John 14, 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now, let me ask a serious question to us this morning. In your lifetime, what have you seen the most of? Sunny days or rainy days? It's not a rhetorical question. You could answer me. You have seen more of sunny days than rainy days. No, sunny days. Can you change that? Can I change that? Can we change that? Okay, so listen. If that's what it is, could you change, change circumstances or situations? Can we reverse that? No, we can't reverse the sunny days and make them rainy days or vice versa. It remains. Situations and circumstances were there way before you and I were born. Could you change things that were there before you were born? Could you change everything that is there? Know that you're alive. Not everything. You could change some things. You could change some things. For example, why worry? You have a car. I always go go local. That's my line of work. I've heard people complain about an alternator that is bad. They park the car and they murmur and complain then they borrow money from someone to repair the alternator. Now, God has blessed them for many, many years. They have saved. An alternator is $250. Why don't you stop worrying, take your bank card, go to the bank where you have $7,000 or more, withdraw $235, buy the alternator, put it on. But no, they will borrow from a friend. They will not repay a month end. Two months ends pass. Three of them pass. Then they become an enemies. You have chosen to become that person's enemies. Because God put it in place. I have found out that there are things, no matter how much you pray for, God will not give us. Because we can handle it ourselves. God will handle the things that we cannot handle. Not the things we can handle. Don't tell me you have $7,000 on your bank and you can't spend $250 to buy an alternator for your car or a starter or a tire and you're going to make enemy with somebody that you borrow money from. Come on. And you're worrying? You should, you, should, you should be happy that God has blessed you, that you have a saving. I told you I'm not preaching doctrine. I'm preaching facts. And that's how life goes. Now, are you worried? Let's hear what God has to say through his word. On the screen, we will have Psalms 4, verse 8. And I would like us to read together. I'll wait for them on the screen. Psalms 4, verse 8. 
We have a few verses of scripture. What does it say? Okay, let's go again. I will lie down and sleep what? Well, my version might be different. In peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's look at Psalms 91 verses 1 and 2. But this time you have to read with me. He that dwelleth in the circuit place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. Verse 2. Now let's go to Psalms 119, 119, verse 165. We're speaking about ways and means not to worry. It says, We're going to the scripture. Proverbs 3, 24. Remember I mentioned a while ago that you worry because you have something to do and God has already provided. All you have to do is take a bank card and just walk across and be happy. And you even be an enemy as a result. Here what it says, your sleep shall be sweet. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Are we there? Isaiah 26 verse 3. All right, let's go to the New Testament again. John 14, 1. Do not love. Trust in God. We're still in John 14, 27. Okay, we're moving to Romans. Romans 8, 6. All right, now we're going to the final two or so. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Now listen to that. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Okay, we're going to verse 19 now of Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will... Okay, but I love that one. The final one, 1 Peter 5, 7. Listen what it says. Cast. Are we there? Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, with all that being read, many of us don't need to hear doctrines being preached. What we need is a dose of reality, a dose of the here and now. Happiness is not found in tangible things. Yes, but not tangible things only. I don't care where you are right now or what circumstances you are facing. But God just wants to tell us, don't worry, for I am here. I am here by your side and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, to be sure, reaching a goal or obtaining something we have desired can make us happy. All right. But that kind of happiness can be fleeting. Lasting happiness is not based solely on achievements or acquisitions. Rather, like good physical health, true happiness depends on a variety of factors. Each of us is unique. What makes you happy may not make someone else happy. Additionally, we change as we get older. Huh. We change as we get older. The things 
that never used to bother us 30 years ago. You want me to go ahead? The things, children, you are not 30 years yet, so don't even think on that. That used to bother us 30 years ago. 30 years hence, or 30 years now, or 30 years forward. It's going to bother us to the point that what was that? Else? You got to be careful what comes out your mouth 30 years after. Our patience wears out with certain things. And that's why we have to stick, stick close to God. Because let me tell you something. More tolerance. Thank you very much. Thanks for helping me. Let me tell you something. You think it's only turtles snap? Or alligators or crocodiles? We snap sometimes, you know. And if whatever is in our way doesn't move at that instant, it gets snapped. Now, it's a lesson for us. We have to be more tolerant. We have to. You see, there are so many things that associates with happiness, true happiness. Let me give us six keys to being happy. First, founding, well, it's finding contentment. Bible principle, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he have said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Another translation puts it that way. Let your way of life be free of the love of money. I don't know where to get that from. While you are content with the present things. Ecclesiastes 7, 12 says, For wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Money is a protection observed by a wise student of human nature. But he also wrote, Ecclesiastes 5.10, that a lover of silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. The writer, King Solomon, of ancient Israel, actually experimented this to see whether wealth and luxurious living fostered true happiness. He said in Ecclesiastes 2.10, he wrote, I did not deny myself anything that I desired. I did not withhold from my heart any sort of pleasure. What did, his, what did he learn? His experiment made him somewhat happy, but not for long. I saw that everything was futile. He even came to hate life. Yes, Solomon learned that a life of self-indulgence ultimately leaves one feeling empty and unsatisfied. No, my question is, do modern study agree with that ancient wisdom? That's my question. An article published in the book Journal of Happiness Studies says that, and I quote, after one's basic needs are satisfied, additional income does little to advance one's subjective well-being, unquote. Indeed, findings show that increased material consumption, especially at the cost of moral and spiritual values, can erode happiness. Avoid envy, that's the second one. A Bible principle, Galatians 5.26, let, let us not become egotistical, stirring up competition with one another, envying one another. That's what it says. Envy is defined as the painful or resentful awareness of an advent advantage enjoyed by another accompanied by a desire to possess the same advantage. Now, like a malignant growth, envy can take over one's life and destroy happiness. You ask, how might envy take root? 
let me tell you, the Encyclopedia of Social Psychology observes that people tend to envy their equals, perhaps in age, experience, or social backgrounds. For example, a salesman, for instance, might not envy a famous movie star, but he might envy a more successful fellow salesman. So with a tax, so with a taxi driver, so with a hairdresser. I didn't, I didn't exclude myself. So with a mechanic. Someone is. I'm not going to envy a pilot, but it is part of our fiber. Envy, selfishness, greed. Have you seen when a baby was born or is born? What happens? I learned that from elderly folks. Have you ever seen a baby, for those who watch the babies being born, come up the womb with their hands wide open? It is always, I come for everything. I want all. That's a selfish inclination in us. A baby, as far as I checked, has never been born with the hands wide open that way. It's always fisted, closed tight. And when you open it, there's nothing in it. That's what happens. Nothing we come with, and we go with nothing. We go with nothing. It is important to recognize the hostile nature of envy, says the Encyclopedia of Social Psychology. This hostility explains why envy is associated with so many historical cases of aggression. An outstanding historical case involves Jesus Christ. Mark 15 10 says that out of envy, the chief priest, what he did, he handed Jesus over to be executed. The same encyclopedia of social psychology says, and I quote, Envy can poison a person's capacity to enjoy the good things in life and sniff out feelings of gratitude for life's many gifts. Such tendencies are hardly conducive to happiness, unquote. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, We combat envy by cultivating genuine humility and modesty, which enables us to appreciate and to value the abilities of good qualities, of the good qualities of, in others. We should cultivate love for people. That's my third out of the six um, principles. Clothe yourself, as found in Colossians 3, 14. Clothe yourself with love. For it is a perfect bond of union. Again, from the Encyclopedia of Social Psychology, I quote, People's feelings about their relationships have bigger impact on their overall satisfaction with their lives than do their jobs, their income, their community, or even physical health. Simply put, in order to be truly happy, Humans need to give and receive love. If I do not have love, I am nothing. First Corinthians 13, 2. The fourth one is building resilience. A Bible principle found in James 1, 2. Happy is the man who keeps enduring trial. Because on becoming approved, he will receive the crown of life. Question, who has a problem-free life? Which one of us sitting here, or even those viewing online, has a problem-free life? No problems in life. Everybody has. Everybody has. Now, imagine, as the Bible says, there is a time for everything, a time to weep, and a time to will. It's because it has this uh, three, four. Resilience helps us to get through such times, to bounce back from adversity. It is said of Carol, who has spinal degenerative disease, she has diabetes, she has sleep apnea, and glycoma 
that has blinded her left eye. Yet, she says, listen, she said, I try not to feel discouraged for too long. I allow myself my pity party. But then I set my feelings aside and thank God for what I am still able to do, especially for other people. You see her condition? And she's still thanking God. When people who are re resilient make mistakes, we know what they do? They do not berate themselves with self-defeating language, such as, I am a failure, or I am useless. The Bible says, a crushed spirit saps one's strength. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good. In the book, The Power of Resilience, it says that you must recognize that mistakes and failures are a natural occurrence. Your choice is the manner in which you respond to these events. Number five, show yourself thankful. Oh, yes, show yourself thankful. You know how many times we are supposed to say thanks or act like we're, we're really thankful, and we don't. We do not. Be thankful. A Bible principle, Colossians 3.15. And I'll read the last part. It says, and show yourself thankful. Now, it is suggested that reflecting on positive aspects of our lives and showing appreciation for kindness rendered us can foster a healthier sense of well-being. Number six, last and final. Apply the wise counsels of the Bible. Bible principle, Proverbs 3, 13 to 18. A tree of life to those who take hold of it. Well, now, why not discover that truth for yourself? By tapping into the wisdom recorded in the Bible. After all, the writer of this sacred book, who is also called the happy God, wants you and I to be happy too. So brethren, let me, rem let me remind us once again, from the bottom of my heart, don't worry. Be happy in Jesus' name. Remember, spare sowing, spare reaping. So bountifully, and you will reap bountifully. Each person should give as he has received of the Lord. Therefore, there should be no reluctance, or we should not give of compulsion. But God loves a cheerful giver. At this time, the deacons will wait on us for our tithes our offerings, and our gifts. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we truly thank you that we can return a portion of which you have blessed us with. We recognize that you own everything. And as we give, may this go to the furtherance of your work. And as we give, Lord, help us not to just give but we would give ourselves totally to you and your service. In Jesus' name we pray.